Hi there, uh, VA113. This is uh, going to be my last demo video for the course. I hope you've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it with you. And um, yeah, so uh, I've decided to make one more video. Somebody uh, asked about learning pastels and uh, so I thought I'd give it a shot. Um, I don't work in color a whole lot. I I tend to do a lot of black and white work myself, but I do like color, and it is a whole other dimension that uh, could you could uh, f have a whole separate class focused on just that. But it's worth uh, touching on and experimenting with. So I've got this um, self portrait sketch in uh, in pencil, and I'm going to first talk a little bit about the color wheel i'm going to talk about pastels and i'm going to show some examples and i'll do a quick uh, demo so uh, <clears throat> many artists have a tool called a color wheel like this this one's pretty fancy it's got two sides and when you spin it uh, you can uh, use this chart to figure out the difference between complementary colors and uh, tertiary colors uh, I'm not going to go into it because that's, again, that's a whole other demo. But basically, in a color wheel, uh, you have uh, the primaries, yellow, red, orange. And then the secondaries are um, orange, green, purple. Notice how they, uh, they fit in between the uh, primaries. And then the tertiary colors are... Uh, made by mixing a, a primary color with an adjacent secondary color. Uh, so then you get a tertiary here, here, there, there, and there. Okay, so there's a primary, red, purple is secondary. You mix them, you get a tertiary. And if, if you've ever seen a prism or even like a, um, a rainbow, and this is the breakdown of how light, uh, how, how colors uh, are separated uh, when you uh, sp split uh, light apart. It's pretty fascinating stuff. And artists use a wheel like this to figure out how to balance uh, color in a composition because the um, whatever is on one side of the color wheel has this very, very strong... Uh, contrast with the other side. They call them complementary colors. And uh, you see it in advertising, you see it in fashion. Uh, like red and green are associated with Christmas and they, they just kind of are very, they, they react against each other. But you can, you can use them, um, you can use them compositionally, but just understanding that they kind of have a huge amount of contrast back and forth as does yellow versus violet and orange versus blue so if you want to have colors that aren't that aren't in so much contrast to each other then you would go yellow green to blue or green to blue and not go straight across the the wheel okay so um that's color. Oh yeah, and one other thing is that if you were to look on this side, everything here uh, from yellow to uh, purple is considered, or red-violet is considered warmer, and everything on this side is considered cooler. So um, that I think that's sort of self-explanatory. You see uh, the warm side of colors in highlights and you see the cooler side of colors in shadows and uh, here is an example okay you have warmer colors here cooler colors there even though one normally wouldn't ex might not expect to see green in a shadow on a face but uh, sometimes it actually is there uh, green purple blue uh, not just brown in the shadows based on the quality of light uh, hitting um, a face and what the light is bouncing off of. See, like you, this uh, 
woman has got a green scarf. So when the light comes off here and bounces up, it's going to have this green cast underneath. And there's a little bit of green right there, a little bit of green right there. And when, you, when it's well done, the viewer consciously or unconsciously accepts this and says, yeah, this looks really good. But uh, for the artist, they want to really consciously notice this stuff and go, okay, so that's how you can use green on a face and make it look, um, make it look uh, visually correct. Okay. Uh, so while I have this book open, this is Portrait Painting Atelier. And uh, there's a little bit of subtle green in here. Uh, mostly this painting is, you know, it, it, it's the color use isn't quite as um, expressive, shall I say, uh, as this one. But it's still got some, uh, it's still got qu quite an interesting range. And then if I flip to here, there's on this uh, image, there's some blues here and some purples and greens right in the shadow area. Okay. Um, because color is, to, to, uh, is so complex and it takes a while to learn. So what I'm suggesting is for this, uh, see, look at this guy. Look how, look at the range of tone inside him. And then all the, there's, there's a range of colors and a range of tones. So my suggestion for this, like you can do it any way you want, um, is to try to go do something a little bit more on the abstract side, because uh, to try to paint something realistically on your first go uh, is, it, it's, it's, it might be setting the bar a little bit high. Uh, so my suggestion is to do something a little bit more on the abstract side and have fun with it and not worry about trying to make something that looks photo real because this takes a while to learn, right? So I've pulled out a few more examples. Uh, here's Cezanne. And here he's using, uh, well, this is more of a portrait of a body, like a, a, a study, but uh, you notice there's um, a range of warm tones and cool tones. And then this is Andre Dere. And uh, there's a there's a light hitting the body here from the from the right side and then you see like a, a shadow here a shadow there shadow there even a little bit of shadow in there so he's using uh cool tones uh like a bit of a purpley blue and a green and a mixture of navy blue and dark green throughout this shadow area and then on the highlights it's mostly orange and yellow so actually, I'm going to just go back to that other image so you can get a better look. So just look at the range of color um, use, but it, it it's mostly both of these. You could you could say that there's only like like this one has it, this whole face is mainly three colors, right? There's orange, green and brown. And then this figure is mostly blue and yellow. So while you can have a whole range of colors, I, my suggestion is to, when you're first trying this out, to try to keep it simple. Uh, just don't overdo it, okay? So pick, pick one light, uh, one warm color, and one cool color, and experiment with that. Uh, here's uh, Karl Schmidt Roloff. It's not quite as famous as the other two, but uh, here you see an interesting uh, use of, again, um, highlights with warm colors and then uh, a little bit of brown and uh, and green for the shadows over here. Okay, um, so those are some examples. This is, this is Klimt, one of my favorites, and here is a portrait of Johanna Stoud. And 
this while like this flesh tone is a little bit more naturalistic than some of the other examples uh, you also see uh, uh his use of blue instead of brown as his uh, shadow area it's quite effective okay all right uh obviously you can pause the video at any time if you want to study these those examples more great thing about pre-recorded video is that uh you can go back and forth and watch it as many times as you want. Um, okay. The people who got the uh, kit from from um, the, the bookstore, uh, it came with pastels, and I'm assuming it came with oil pastels, but I, I don't actually know because I didn't see it myself. These are oil pastels. Uh, there's pigment, and then there's an oil base. And these, for some reason, they just kind of develop like this white film that you can just rub off. And it's basically like a crayon. Um, it's basically a crayon uh, with kind of more intense pigment. And that's my set of oil pastels. And this is a set of chalk pastels. Uh, so they they rub off on your hands more than the oil pastel. So if I went like this with an oil pastel, it doesn't rub off quite as much. So they're you could say they're not as messy. And this set is fairly high quality. And if you drop these, they break. Whereas if you drop these, they're a little tougher. So I'd say that these are denser. And when you work with these, they, um, they, they're, 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 since they're brittle, uh, they kind of uh, crumble onto the page more easily. I'll make it a quick demo. Let's take a nice blue like this. And you can rub it around whereas if you take the take the uh oil pastel you can rub it a little bit but it doesn't really move that much so uh this this is i encourage people to experiment because the amount of pigment you're using here is very very little and look at that i just made green okay so so uh, there's not really any uh, one, like there's not one type that I think is better than the other, but I would say that the chalk pastel is a little bit more versatile because you can uh, blend it and uh, you can erase it uh, to some extent, right? Whereas this one, oil pastel, doesn't, it smudges. Yeah, okay, it does erase a little bit, but um, I don't know. It, it, oh, well, look at that. I didn't think it would erase it, but hey, you know what? I didn't know, I don't know everything about materials, believe it or not. Like I said, I don't use these a ton myself, but um, what we're gonna do is I'm going to have a do a quick demo with this sketch, uh, and in this sketch, I've already established that the light is coming to some extent from the right hand side. You know, in the real world, most of the time the light isn't coming from one light source. It's or even if there's one light source, then it's bouncing off lots of surfaces and illuminating an, an object from different angles. But I'm going to try to color this in the way that uh, this uh, painting by Andre de Rain, if you want to look this up, Andre de Rain. And the other person that you would be good to look up, um, I don't have a... a a reference here is Henri Matisse, M-A-T-I-S-S-E. 
associated with fauvism, F-A-U-V-I-S-M. So look up fauvism and Matisse, and uh, you'd get a lot of good examples of how to use color like this. Very expressive. You're not so worried about about uh, being perfectly accurate and photoreal. And uh, this application where you have like these big fat brush strokes, like dabs, it, you could is it described as being painterly. Uh, as opposed to a painting like this, which, you know, it's, it's shrunk down. So if we're looking at the real painting, you might see more brush strokes, but it's still very polished and smoothed out. And even though it's obviously paint, this is not what people would um, be referring to. And when, he, when they say something is painterly, uh, because it looks a little bit more like a, a photograph, it's very smooth. Um, what I like here, as an aside, is how the artist has made the the hair back here a little bit blurry uh, to kind of suggest that it's farther back, uh, which kind of references photography in its own way because there's a, a, a depth of field being implied where this is in focus and that's not in focus. And when you compare that to this, uh, the whole thing is kind of treated with the same level of focus. There's not much going on in the background, but but uh, it's not so polished. So this is considered more painterly. All right. Um, as I said, I don't I don't want to make this demo too too long. Uh, my I'm going to leave. I've got too many things here. leave that there okay and then I gonna use the chalk pastel because I think it is a little bit more uh, versatile and I'm basically going to try to color in the self-portrait like this one and so I'm gonna use this yellow and maybe a little bit of this orange this brown um, what else? I've got a good, there's a little bit of this blue and I don't think I want to go with something quite this punchy. Uh, I'm going to try to go with something a little bit more subtle. So this has got, there's a gray here, which I might be able to tint a little bit with blue, uh, but but I don't, I, I'm going to try to be a little bit more subtle because none of, like this, this blue and the green here, they're a bit desaturated, uh, which means they're kind of closer to being a gray rather than a full, rich, saturated pigment. Okay. So what I'm going to do first is if I, I'm going to treat this yellow as sort of a base tone. And I'm going to try not to smudge it with my hand. This requires a little bit of bravery, especially if you're new to drawing and, you know, you made a drawing that you're really happy with and you're worried about uh, messing it up. I totally get that. So in one of my other videos uh, where I was drawing Malcolm, I... I traced him with tracing paper and I transferred it to another sheet of paper so that I'd have two copies. So, um, so basically, yeah, you tape a piece of tracing paper on top with a heavy black, um, like a dark pencil. You trace the lines of the major shapes very carefully with the tracing paper taped down firmly, trace all the major shapes. Then on the back, you, you take the tracing paper, flip it over, go over those lines from the back, then flip it back to the original side on a new sheet of paper, tape it down, and then trace those lines that you drew now twice, 
tr trace it one more time. You could use a pencil crayon this time if you wanted to, because then, then you'd know which lines you've gone over and which ones you haven't. But that will basically um, press the, your second drawing when you trace the back. You'll, you'll press it to a new sheet of paper and you transfer the drawing with an analog uh, old uh, drawing technique onto a new sheet of paper and you didn't mess up your original. Okay. Uh, what I am gonna do here is I'm gonna preserve some of these highlights. So I'm gonna take my I guess I could just do some of that later. And because of my my um, needable eraser has gotten so big, I've just kind of stuck a whole bunch together. And I don't want the whole thing saturated with color, so I'm just gonna take a small chunk of it and What I'm going to do is, even though I intend to add uh, some blue or green to the shadow area, but I'm going to just put a base coat everywhere that I want to have some saturation of yellow and preserve some highlights where the, the light is hitting it from the right hand side. And then... I'm gonna take this, mess it around. I did contemplate uh, fixing spray fixing this first, but I just didn't have enough time because I I knew that if I started smudging this around, it's gonna get a little bit muddy with like like the graphite, right? See that? When you start smudging graphite around, it it smudges. So and it's gonna dirty up my yellow, but. I didn't really have time to spray fix it. I'm just letting you know that that's a thing to consider for people who did have fixative. Or if you have hairspray at home, you can always um, spray a pencil drawing or charcoal drawing with hairspray and it will gray it out a tiny, tiny bit. Like it'll kind of make the entire thing a tiny bit grayed out. Um, that's, it sort of like takes the, all like the, in, on the tonal range, if zero is pure white or one is pure white, then it kind of turns it into a number two or number three. Uh, but I think it's worth it to spray paint, spray a drawing that you want to protect. Okay. This is fun. I feel like a kid doing this. because it's kind of smooths it out. And now I've maintained the highlights on the right hand side that's hitting the cheek, this part of the brow, um, that side of the mouth, the nose, and then there's a little bit right here, a little bit there, a little bit there. And I'm if I get a little bit off, it's not too big a deal because I'm not trying to make this a perfectly, um, I'm not trying to make this really uh, too tightly controlled. I'm going to just try to have some fun with it. Theoretically, you should see some scalp through my short hair. So I am going to put a little bit of pigment here. It's going to look, a, it would look a little bit weird if there was no color there. Okay. Uh... What's next? Okay, let's have some orange as a mid-tone. So I've got orange there, there, there. Okay, so. That is very saturated. So I'm going to Apply it somewhat carefully, especially when I'm trying to work in the, these smaller areas. 
I'm going to try to be a little bit careful with it. Because I'm doing the this all with um, chalk pastel, I have some assurance that I can erase it and pull some of that pigment off later if I don't like how this is going. Does it look like I have a sunburn yet? Maybe a little bit, hey? That's okay. This is a process of discovery. A discovery of if I'm going to have skin cancer. Okay, um, next, bravery test. Okay. Blue, like I said, this is pretty punchy. Um, and then this one less so, but when I look at my example here, there's like a bit of, there's green and dark green there, bits of blue. So it looks like, if I go look at this, it looks like it's a mixture. What's that one? That's another, that's a light blue. So I've got this one and those ones. So let's take it one step at a time. Those two are slightly different. So I've got four blues and a couple different greens. I'm not a big fan of this one right for this, for what I'm doing here. So I'm going to leave it. Um, I think this one is the most similar to that color right there. So let's try that first. Like I said, you don't want to really do too many colors or else it's going to look kind of weird. I mean, it, it's already it's obviously kind of a painting that's not really super realistic to begin with. But having too many colors gives... Um, it's not that it's wrong. It just might be uh, not as cohesive as it could be. So it's pretty hard to like have any hard and fast rules. Uh, if I go like this, uh, yeah, I made this one earlier, and I wasn't super crazy about the way it turned out. Um, it was just a test, but uh, definitely you could see that I was trying to do the the lights or the highlights with uh, warm colors, and then shadows with cool colors. So it's just a test, and I decided that there's nothing wrong with it because because there's not really any rules you're you're just you're creating an image and and uh, seeing what happens but I, I decided I, I wanted to go for something that felt a little bit more cohesive so that's this is what I'm going for okay so um given that I've made sort of these these rules saying like this is my highlights and these are my shadows then I should be consistent and go okay there's should be a shadow in here, right there, right there, there, and there, and there. Maybe one in there. So the more you draw faces, the more you recognize that it's the whole face is just a series of planes and objects that stick out or recede and uh, if you understand it as a three-dimensional shape, 
Here's my, my foam head. See, look at how the light moves based on how I turn it, right? So, because the light is coming from this direction, then everything that is a plane that curves away this way is going to be in some amount of shadow. And I am going to experiment with a little bit of blue just to see what happens. I am not going to put all of this in shadow because I'm keeping in mind that there's that reflected light that comes, that bounces back. So the light comes here. There are some walls or, or other surfaces where the light bounces back. And then you get this reflected light here. And maybe a little bit right there, a little bit right there. So that's what makes, helps to make this feel like a three-dimensional object. Um, great example of that again is look at this lady here in the light. There's a highlight here, shadow, reflected light right there. That little strip right there, that reflected light. So the light comes from, comes back, bounces off her chest here or bounces off walls, lights that right up, right in there. And that's what makes it feel like a, a, a three-dimensional volume. Okay. I am getting pretty dirty. All right, what should I do with my hair? Um, should I make it brown? I don't know. I think I'm going to make it a dark green. Maybe in, th in this picture, it's a mixture of dark green and brown. It looks like mostly green. That's pretty dark, or, but it's, it's pretty saturated and I don't really like how it, it's so bright. So I'm going to try to push it back a little bit. I'm also looking at what's going on in the background here and Andre de Rain used a uh, mixture of like a yellow ochre with green so it's kind of a kind of this muddy background um, I don't have strictly those colors but I can might be able to mix something together so I'm not going to, I'm trying to not make it too saturated because I want to make sure my figure pops. And 
and then he used a little bit of brown. This is a very warm kind of brown. It's not, it's a sanguine. There you go. I wasn't sure if they were labeled. Uh, the wrapper on this one is gone, but I mean, sometimes you don't need to know the name of it. You just need to know, need to look at what it's doing. So I put a little bit here. That certainly makes it a little bit muddier and duller. And the more texture you have, the more it comes forward. So if I make the background muddier, then it should push it back. Um, let's see here. It's looking pretty good, but I think we could add some, a little bit of more warmth. So uh, there's like this kind of pink highlight here and uh, a warmer orange right here. And then of definitely some red on his lips. So I've got, as far as my really warm colors, I got these three to pick, okay? Um, they are so bright, so I'm going to try to use it a little bit more on the conservative side. And he also has a little bit of purple in some areas, so. It goes without saying that cheeks can be very rosy. So let's see what happens if I put a little bit there. That looks pretty good. And a little bit there. Hey, am I overdoing it? Sometimes you don't know until you do it. I think this area is a little bit rosier than I want it, so I'm going to see if I can lift some of that off. doing my best to try to maintain some of that reflected light. And right here, that divot under the, under, under the nose, I want to maintain a highlight right there because you, um, you have like a plane here and a plane there and then this divot that, that's like a bowl, right? And I think it's important to maintain that shape, that sculptural quality. Same with this, un the underside of the eyelid. You can, essentially you're sculpting with the eraser by bringing out points that stick out. Uh, right here, I think I should try to establish the cast shadow com coming off the nose. Okay. How are we doing? What if I added a little bit of this just along here, like here, because if I darken this up a little bit, it should make this highlight pop. But for this, I'm going to try to maintain that edge. Try to 
work cleanly around this edge so that that pops a little bit. I'm going to put a little bit of brown in it just to push it back, not make it so quite so saturated. I'm going to take a little bit of brown or blue, to just gently add it to the eyes, even though my eyes are not blue, but I just thought it would be an interesting experiment. Um, I think there should be a little bit more shadow under here. Okay, um, I, I hope that's helped. Uh, I think by going with something that's a little bit more abstract, um, more abstract use of color that uh, we've cr I've created something where the expectations aren't so high about creating something um, photorealistic, which I think is just a really, really high bar for students to set themselves against uh, when they're uh, still new to drawing and painting. Um, but hopefully this has helped demonstrate some of the basic uses of, um, pastels, but also thinking about the way they can use, uh, warm colors and cool colors to describe highlights and shadows. And as long as you understand, you know, if, as long, if you have a drawing where you've established a, um, and that, that difference between the highlights and shadows and you use cool, uh, warm colors and cool colors and uh, just try to have fun with it, then you might make something that will, that you'll be surprised with. Okay, um, thank you so much for watching and I really can't wait to see what you do. Take care.